Section 2 of The Black Cat, Volume 1, Number 9, June 1896. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Cat, Volume 1, Number 9, June 1896. Section 2. Mrs. Sloane's Curiosity by Mabel Shippy Clark. A scene of embarrassment was in progress in Mrs. Parker Sloane's library. Mrs. Sloane was very much a woman of the world, yet it was evident that there was an undercurrent of feeling beneath her air of calm attention. The young man before her, though usually of enviable self-possession, wore an expression approaching guilt. The fact was that Mr. Sims, Mr. G. Period F. Period S. Period Sims, North Carolina, his card read, in the generous style in which Southerners imply that they are known throughout their state. Mr. Sims was asking Mrs. Sloan for the privilege of marrying her daughter, and Mrs. Sloan very properly had asked him several questions, one of which he had declined to answer, hence the strange situation. Not that it should be inferred for a moment that so practical and far-seeing a person as Mrs. Sloan had not made investigation anent Mr. Sims and his position, financial and social, long before his ardor had reached the present crisis. Left for many years a widow, she had proved herself an excellent woman of business, and when young Sims became devoted to Natalie, she had, as a matter of course, written to a lawyer in the town from which he came and asked certain questions which she felt sure that Mr. Sloan would have asked had he been living. The reply had been satisfactory. G. Period, F. Period, S. Period Sims was the only child and heir of McCrae Sims, a man rich, philanthropic, and eccentric. Mr. Sims had left his son this, that, and the other real estate, valued in an amount that would have gone far to content Mrs. Sloan had his social position been not so satisfactory as it was. She knew, besides, that he had come to Boston well introduced, was a member of two good clubs, was good-looking with the dark hair and eyes that Northerners think is more typical of the South than is true, and was well-read and altogether a desirable match for Natalie. Of course, Natalie knew nothing of her mother's researches. She had been asked to be the handsome young fellow's wife, and she had said that she would if Mama was willing. There was a look in her blue eyes, a look strikingly like her mother's, too, that said that she would even if Mama were not willing. And now, this painful interview. It had not been painful until after Mrs. Sloan had asked her questions, very spontaneously be it said to the credit of her dramatic power, and received replies to them which corroborated her North Carolina correspondent, and at last had said with her most gracious smile, for she could be very winning, My dear Mr. Sims, I see no reason why you and Natalie should not be happy, and as for me I shall be glad to have a son as well as a daughter. Sims had beamed upon her, and had thought her charming with her fine figure and snow-white hair rolled high above her still fresh face, but she spoiled it all. Mr. Sims had known that it must come sooner or later, but he wished that it had not come just now when he was so happy. It seems curious to think that, though we know you so well, we don't know your first name. What am I to call my son? Mr. Sims flushed, but answered without hesitation. My family and my intimate friends have always called me G. G. How very strange. And what is it really? Oh, a curious name of my father's selection. I've told you, haven't I, that he was eccentric? I always say that a child ought not to have a name until he is old enough to be consulted about it. And yours is... tentatively. Sims felt that he must take his stand at once, and he replied with decision. My name, Mrs. Sloan, is very disagreeable to me, and I have never used anything but my initials. My family and friends, as I said, have called me G, and I should prefer not to tell my Christian name even to you.
It was here that Mrs. Sloane's appearance of calm attention was ruffled just a wee bit by the irritation she was experiencing, and that the young man on the other side of the room wore a distinctly guilty look. He gazed beyond his prospective mother-in-law out of the window and across the Charles River to the picturesque boathouse on the other shore. There is a long main street in Norham, as in many New England towns, bordered by graceful elms and lined by pretty houses whose grounds on one side of the road slope to the river. Mrs. Sloane's was one of these, a fine old dwelling of revolutionary date with a long library extending the length of the house. The rear window afforded an outlook for Mr. Sims's embarrassed gaze. Perhaps Mrs. Sloan would have let the subject drop at this point had she not happened to glance out of the front window and see, walking down Main Street, Mrs. Mortimer. At once there sounded upon her mental ear the questions that Mrs. Mortimer would ask about Natalie's betrothed, and the interrogations that would be put by Mrs. Mortimer's sisters, Mrs. Weston and Mrs. Bates, and her husband's sister, Mary Lyman, and her brother's wife, Dora Munro, and her cousins, the Lethingwells, and her West Norham connections, the Dorseys, and all the network of relatives and kinsmen who comprised the descendants of three or four of the early settlers of the town. Thinking thus, and unobservant of the straight line into which Sim's mouth had settled, Mrs. Sloan began again. But wouldn't it be better for us to talk it over frankly now? You see, there will be so many questions asked about a newcomer. Norm is like Concord and Andover. It requires a residence of three generations at least to remove the stigma of being a late arrival. She said it very well, but she had met with an obstinacy equal to her own. Should it ever be necessary, Mrs. Sloan, you may depend upon me for meeting the necessity, and until then let me ask that you will not refer to the matter. And Natalie? I suppose I may see her now, returned Sims, willfully misunderstanding her. Mrs. Sloan went to call her daughter, and G told her all about it and she said that she didn't care the least bit in the world what his name was or whether he had any at all. However, as time went on, Natalie saw an uncomfortable something in the mental atmosphere to which even the preparations for the wedding could not blind her. For one thing, her mother and her lover, the two people she loved most dearly, were on terms of formality which she could not change. Then the torrents of questions that her mother had anticipated duly were asked, and Natalie grew tired of saying, He has a funny name that he doesn't like, and I always call him G. And of being begged, Oh, do tell me what it is, Natalie. I'll never tell. At first she owned frankly that she did not know it, and was met by a stare of amazement. Then these friends went forth and told others. After several people had said, I understand that you don't know what Mr. Sims' name is, Natalie. And several more had hinted, just hinted, delicately to Mrs. Sloane. Do you think it's quite safe to let Natalie marry, er, you know? And after Mrs. Sloane could endure it no longer, and had given her daughter a sound scolding for the delinquencies of her lover, it was after all this that Natalie told G all about it, and cried out all her worry, an annoyance on the shoulder that its possessor hoped would bear her burdens for her evermore. Now listen, sweetheart, I'll tell you this miserable old name, and you can tell your mother and everyone else if you like that you know it. But what it is, I don't want you to make known to anyone at all unless I give you permission. Will you promise? Of course, Natalie promised. Then G whispered to her, Oh, G! Not really. That's awful. Oh. And the young girl sat aghast, looking at the man she loved as if he were a living curiosity. Isn't it a howler pet? Do you wonder I don't use it? How do you think your mother would like it? Can't you change it, G? My dear, it was given me by my father, a good man but extremely eccentric. When as a boy I rebelled against it, he declared that if I gave up my Christian name, I gave up my family name as well, and as I love and respect his memory, as I loved and respected him, I shall continue to bear the name he gave me, though it has proved and still will prove a great annoyance. 
Naturally, it was not soothing to Mrs. Sloane to know that her daughter knew a secret that she did not, even though it concerned Natalie more nearly than it did her mother. Her curiosity was aroused to the highest pitch. She wrote to the lawyer in North Carolina with whom she had corresponded before, but from him she received no reply. Perhaps he thought it a question too trivial to answer. Perhaps G, who knows, had forestalled her. Then she secured all the lists of students published by the University of Virginia during the years when Sims was in residence there, only to find the initials G period, F period, S period, and not the full name as a reward for her search. Sims had had a hard struggle with the authorities for four years about those catalogs, and had won his case only by refusing absolutely to tell his name. And, of course, they could not put in what they did not know. As the time appointed for the wedding drew near, Mrs. Sloane's annoyance was so great that Natalie ventured to intercede with G. Do tell her, G. I believe that once you tell her, she'll forget all this irritation and be sweet again. I'll tell you what, dear. I'll compromise with her, returned G. You wait here while I go and speak to her. And he ran up to Mrs. Sloane's sitting room like a repentant schoolboy. Mrs. Sloane, he said. I've come to compromise. I'm truly sorry that not telling you my name annoys you and agree to have it in full on the wedding invitations, provided you agree that Natalie shall not get a single peep at them till they are sent out. After due deliberation, the compromise was accepted. Mr. Sims visited the engraver after the cards had been ordered by Mrs. Sloane, and at the proper time the bundle came home. Mrs. Sloane did not disguise her eagerness to cut the strings and hastily seized the uppermost sheet. It read, Mrs. Parker Sloane invites you to be present at the marriage of her daughter Natalie to Mr. Greenville Female Seminary Sims on Wednesday, June 1st at 5 o'clock in the First Church, Norham, 1895. That is how the descendant of the Massachusetts Puritans became one of the joint owners of a name which is really inscribed on the records of a southern state. This may sound like romance, but it is an actual fact, and one which can easily be verified. End of section 2